This material is, is going to be necessary for the final tutorial on, on Monday. And we, I hope to basically cover just the general concepts of what is needed to solve this tutorial. So we won't go into a lot of the details. I'd like you to focus on the principles that you use for troubleshooting. So you will see up here in the slides some complicated text. There's more text than you've probably seen in your current slides. Don't copy it down. The idea is not to copy down and solve this case study. The idea is to see how we solve this case study and apply it to your case study on Monday. The text that's in these slides will be posted on the website. So you can get it down if you need to go on. So yesterday we, uh, we spoke primarily about the engage step, where you, you get over that that initial surge of anxiety and you, you recognize that you are capable of solving this problem. The second part of the, of the procedure is to define the problem. So when you look at defining what is the issue, where the issue is, what cause, what potential issues, uh, what causes might, might have come up. Uh, so you really just clarify in mind what it is and what it is not. Okay, so you eliminate for example, in this case, then it's not the packed bed that's the issue, it's around the fire heater that the issue is. So you, you clarify in the mind where you're going to be looking. Now the explore stage is where we're going to spend some time today, uh, initially, and then we're going to move on to the next step, planning. These two steps, three and four, are the where you'll spend the majority of the time. So let's let's uh, focus on that then. We said yesterday. When you're looking at the explore step, what we're essentially trying to do is we're exploring the problem. What, what are the physical principles that we need to be applying here? So in this particular case study with the fire heater, we're looking at issues around the heat transfer. But in, in some of the case studies you'll be looking at in the tutorial on Monday, it's going to be issues around mass and energy balances, recycling, purging. Um, this, the heat transfer might be an issue in some of yours. And so you're looking at essentially finding the principles from your chemical engineering background that you've learned, which there's a few of them, and, and seeing whether they're relevant to the case study or not. Okay. That's going to start triggering all sorts of ideas of what potential causes might be. This is where you need to start writing this down. Okay. So what would you think of heat transfer? You think of conduction, convection, heat transfer area, fouling, temperature differences, all these types of variables. That's what we mean over here. What types of variables are you referring to? These are what you write down on, on the paper in front of you. So that sheet that I handed out yesterday at the back there, you can start to write down in, on the side here, just so that you don't forget what are the potential variables you should be considering. Okay. Now, a lot of people think that we can't test for troubleshooting in the exam, in the final exam. You'll see in today's class that every step up to step four is totally doable without having an actual plant. So absolutely, we can look at testing this and making sure that you follow this procedure. So the key here is when you start looking at what fundamentals might affect the process, write down the variables that affect that process. And then we spoke a bit yesterday about causality. So I, I, I won't recap the example that I, I did over here, but the principle here is essentially if you've got one problem happening, so you've got one symptom that you can visually see or you can see it in your parts in your control room, that symptom or that problem can be due to many causes. And it may be due to multiple causes that occur simultaneously. Okay, so that's that's the other that's a complicated issue. But in general, we'll, we'll consider a single cause and, and, and its corresponding symptom that comes out here. All right. Okay, so this is now where we're up to yesterday's class. We looked at, at considering the fundamentals. Some other things to consider during your explore phase are the following. Do I have consistency amongst my data? One way I can check the consistency is to use the duplicate sensors I have available. In many processes, we have redundant information. Duplicate sensors on the same stream, 
The other way to check for consistency is for a rate process. If I've got flow into a tank at steady state, I need to see roughly the same amount of flow out of the tank. Okay, so, so I need the consistency method. I must balance my flows. So across an entire flow sheet, the flow in must match at steady state flow out. If I don't see that, I know that I'm accumulating flow somewhere. If I don't see pressure being balanced, I know that pressure is accumulating somewhere. So you can check for consistency that way and rule out possible causes. Um, in heat transfer, we expect consistency among the temperatures coming into and out of the heat exchanger. You cannot expect the temperature leaving a heat exchanger on the hot stream to be hotter than an empty exchanger, right? because otherwise energy would not have been exchanged. So the moment you see an inconsistency on the four temperatures in the heat exchanger, so we've always got four temperatures, two in, two out, and we can rank them. So there needs to be a, the absolute lowest temperature from the cold stream, the hottest temperature from the hot stream, and the other two temperatures must be in between. If I see any of those four temperatures out of their expected ordering, what can I conclude from that? What if my coldest stream is now somewhere in the, in, in the intermediate? Rather than being the coldest temperature, it's somewhere in the middle of the... Of the can I make a... Can I really come to some conclusion from that? Anything? What could I conclude from that observation? And what, would you, what would you say if I saw that? This, we know that this can't exist from first principles, so what, what, what is my deduction? We've got to be like Sherlock Holmes here. This is all that troubleshooting is. We're trying to come to fight for who did it, what happened. So if you see that, what would you, what would you say? Faulty temperature sensor. There is a leak in my heat exchanger that I'm maybe measuring the temperature in the wrong place. Um, there's, there's, something's gone wrong. I've got evidence that, yes, this is likely where the issue might be. Okay, so we look for consistency in our data and in the sequences of our data. So don't just look at every variable on its own. It has to be consistent with the rest of the flow sheet. So we are on a distillation column. The temperatures in the distillation column may have a logical sequencing from tray to tray. If they're out of sequence, it indicates a fault in the sensor or a, an actual fault in the column, but it's, it's isolating out of the problem for us. Um, in an equilibrium process, we expect temperature and pressures to be inversely related to each other. Um, we can look at trends in our variables. So for example, in this, flow sh in this problem we were looking at yesterday, uh, let's just put up the trends here. When I increase the feed rate, I see a corresponding increase in the fuel. And I do feedback control. I'm putting more feed into my pipe reserve. To maintain that outlet temperature constant, I need to see an increase in the fuel flow rate. So that trend made sense yesterday. But then the trend started to break down because when I increased the feed rate the second time, my temperature started to drop and my fuel run rose. I didn't, I didn't get the trends that I expected. So investigating what your, your expectations are versus what actually happened is the, the key part of the external step. Okay, so explore step is really just a way for you as a troubleshooter to, to start to bring in ideas that might be related to the problem. So when you're in the tutorial on Monday during the explore phase, you as the troubleshooter are going to be talking out loud and the person who's observing is going to be recording some of your thoughts there to see are you in the explore phase or the observer is going to see, well, no, now you've moved over to the next phase of planning. Based on the verbal thoughts that are coming that, that you're talking, that observer is going to see which phase you're in. Okay, so when you're in the explore phase, you're saying things, well, I see these temperatures are these, are, are these values. I expect them to be in this order based on the fact of heat transfer phenomena. So you, you're verbally saying this out loud in the tutorial on Monday. Normally you'd be saying this in your head. You'd be looking at what these physical principles mean and, and how your expectations match up to reality. So that's, that's the explore, explore step. Other things that you can use to help you is 
the following. Um, You can consider if the process in, is in startup mode or in maintenance mode. When we're in starting up a process, especially for the first time, or if, we're, if the process is just being started after maintenance, we expect quite a few things to go wrong. Okay, so our expectations of what can go wrong are even greater during startup and maintenance. Especially during maintenance, people will mess up equipment that was working just fine prior to that. So your expectations of, of how things are different will depend on whether the process has just been started up or if this is during regular operation. So consider all those aspects. So in, given that, let's take a look back at the example we had in the class yesterday. Some of the things that you can find out in the explore phase, and this is where you as the troubleshooter will be asking the expert system for, yeah. for their advice. So you ask them, for example, you're exploring now, and you're saying, well, I'd like to check, remember this, the issue is here with this temperature that's dropping off. You can ask the expert system, well, is temperature one consistent with temperature four? So that's your, your, your question you're asking. The expert system will respond based on their case study that they, they know the absolute truth. They will tell you, in this case, yes, it is. So TC1 matches temperature four. So immediately there, you've got to you know that that drooping temperature that we're, that's the problem is also going to be seen in, in T4. So we can rule out the fact that it's the sensor that's an issue. Okay, so we'll come up, come next, how to re, how we work things out. So now we're simply exploring the problem, checking consistency. Something else that you can check for consistency is the flow. So the flow in over here, the heat flow, that's the flow, remember, that you've been increasing gradually over the past Last while. If that increases, the flow that I record down here, F7, should also be increasing. So the system just works its way through this pack bed. So if F1 is going up, I should see a corresponding increase in F7 as well. So there's another consistency check. Another one that you can check for is to ask the expert system, this tank is a large storage tank, is the level L1 dropping? If level L1 is not dropping, but F1 is showing an increase in flow, there's an inconsistency there. Likely that that flow meter is broken. So if L1 is dropping, F1 should be showing an increase in flow. Another consistency check is if L1 is dropping, L2 must be rising. So we've got several ways to ask the plant for the expert system to verify whether our sensors are working. So we're checking there for consistency. These are things that you can do very rapidly in the control room if you were there with the operator. Very quickly you can see on the screens what those levels are doing over time. And call up call up the historical data. In most chemical processes you can just click on the variable and it will show you a trend over the past two, three hours or whatever the, the, the range is that has been set. Okay, so, so those are the, um, some of the consistency checks that we get from that. Some things just to be aware of is that when you ask for information, uh, you have to be very clear on what you're asking for. If you ask for the, the temperature, there's a difference between the temperature being 55 degrees versus the sensor being at 55 degrees versus the meter that's actually showing the 55 degrees. Okay, so, so there's, we, we, we need to be clear on that. So we, we're talking amongst ourselves and the operators. We, this will help us rule out whether it's the sensor that's failed um, and being clear on whether it's the temperature or the sensor. Okay, so then the final thing just to mention here is a lot of this will you'll build up as through your career with experience. When you're exploring these variables, one thing to also check is whether these variables are within typical range. Those flows of the valves, the flows in the, um, in the, in the coming into the fire heater, the flow rate of the fuel to the fire heater, the pressures that you see around the fire heater, are those typical values? So those, those you would only accumulate that knowledge based on your prior experience with the process. Or rely on the operator. The other thing is to be aware of opinions. 
we saw that earlier in the, in the polling statement yesterday that uh, one of the operators said that there was a strange smell around the pump. Is that relevant information? It is an opinion, but is it going to be relevant? So we need to we need to seek out opinions from various people, ask for information, but bear in mind we have to be careful on separating fact from opinion. So there's, there's that distinction in between. Okay, and then finally, uh, this is some good advice, uh, and I, I strongly agree with it. The solution to a problem isn't by sitting behind a desk but going out to the plant and carrying out tests and evaluating the data. Um, or even just getting yourself out to the plant is, is, take, gets you a long way there. Sometimes we're not allowed to carry out tests, but um, just getting your ass behind your desk is going to really, in, in no, every problem I've ever solved, that's been key to getting, getting to the root of the problem. Now, this, the second part here is what we're going to look at next, carrying out tests and evaluating the data. Those two are the next two critical steps that we have to be clearing the troubleshoot. So that's where this plan step comes in. Now I'd like you to take a look at the back of your sheet that you got yesterday. Does any, everyone have a copy? Back of that sheet, there's a, a table that looks similar to this on the bottom part, and this is what you're going to fill in as the troubleshoot. And this is what we're going to grade you on, essentially, is to show the systematic approach to working through this problem. The first column is to the working hypothesis, where you brainstorm potential causes for this issue. So we, remember, we're seeing this temperature dropping off. What might be those? What might be some causes for it? So that's the, that goes into the first column, and you would be using all these ideas that we just spoke about in the in that first step. Okay, so remember, uh, so the high step and the small step. We were saying we're considering things around our mass and energy balances, around our thermodynamics, around heat transfer. So when we're looking at at, at these hypotheses or root causes. You're saying things like, well, one reason for the temperature to drop off might be that the fuel's composition has changed. So the fuel that I'm burning in that fire heater may have had a decrease in energy value. That, that's a hypothesis or a root cause. So put that in, the, in one of the rows. You could put things, for example, like that temperature control loop, TC1, is unstable. That controller is not working properly anymore. So TC1, we just back up here, that's this control loop that's feeding the fuel to the fire heater. Something's gone wrong in that control loop. It's now operating in an unstable manner. Another root cause you might think is, well, something's got plugged up in this pack bed. Because I'm increasing the feed flow over here. But if this pack bed is, is plugged up, Essentially, less fuel is getting to it and I'm accumulating some, some material in there. And so that, that temperature is, is dropping. I'm essentially getting lower flow through the system. I'm seeing this transient behavior. So you can go through and brainstorm particular ideas. The sensor response, we've actually already ruled that one out. So I'll show you what we do with that in a minute. The key here is not to, not to just simply discard ideas and say, well, this is useless. The key, the key point here is to write every idea that you think of that could be a root cause. I'm going to show you in the next slide how you eliminate those in a systematic way. So anything that could be feasible that could cause this problem is something that could be written down there. The stack damper is, is too far closed, or the, the feed flow rate is too high in the system. Or the feed tank that you're feeding this material for is actually it's got a vortex in here and trapping air into that system. So you've got a faulty a faulty flow rate reading. Okay, so all of these hypotheses would would be written down. Then you're going to do in the next columns called initial evidence, we're going to look at, at the information we have and we're going to decide whether that information supports that hypothesis or disproves it or is does neither of them is neutral. Okay. So 
I'll show you this now in this table. This is not in your slides, and this is the one reason why I wanted to put this up. This is far more detailed than um, that's in the slide, but I wanted to show you where you could end up with this. Don't write this down. This is not the point to write this down. The point is here is to understand what the thinking is to get to this table. So this is ultimately what your table could look like at the end of this troubleshooting exercise. The first step, you might say, and it's always valid to start at your first hypothesis is to say, well, nothing is wrong. All I'm observing in those trends are just temporary behavior, and the feedback control system is going to sort it out. It's just a transient blip or, or duration that I'm expecting some deviation. That could be your first hypothesis. The other one might be that, well, the tank that we said we've switched our feed from one tank to the other tank, so we've you were draining one tank out and switched over to a new feed tank. Well, maybe we didn't actually switch tanks. The, op the operator mistakenly thought he had opened and closed the corresponding valve, but hadn't done that actually. One, another one might be that the fuel gas heating value has decreased. That was the one I mentioned earlier, that the energy content of that fuel has dropped off. Another one is that that stack damper has failed open, so the damper is now open. That heat that we normally would retain in the furnace to heat the fuel, to heat the feed, I mean, um, is now being lost out through the vents. So we're going to getting reduced temperature onto that stream leaving the fire heater. Too little area in the fire heater. I'll just jump over some of these and, and talk about one of some of these down here. The air compressor motor may have failed. So to the fire heater, we always feed fuel and air. That air compressor may have failed and what we're essentially seeing is that temperature starting to drop off as our flame has been extinguished we're not able to heat up our material anymore we're just starting to see the initial effect of that happening that immediately if you're thinking that is one of your causes we can start to see how serious this case could be because now we're pumping a whole lot of fuel into a fire heater where the air compressor that's feeding the fire heater hasn't kicked in Oh, it's, it's, sorry, the air compressor is turned off and we're still feeding fuel. Okay, so this could be a potentially uh, safety, a safety issue from a hypothesis point. I'll show you how we can actually rule that out in a minute. Um, the air compressor could have been partially blocked to so feed air, could be partially blocked. Or the third key point down here is that the air flow rate is actually constant, but it's not sufficient to support combustion. So we're, we're, we're adding more fuel than air we have air for. So 12 and 13 are, are similar hypotheses with the same outcome. So either we're, we're, our air flow is blocked, or our air flow is just too little to support the amount of fuel that we have going in. So these are all valid hypotheses. And then a 14th one down here is we've got some impurity coming in our feed that's actually causing an endothermic reaction in that pipe in the fire heater. So while the material should be being heated, there's actually some side reaction taking place that's consuming the heat that we're adding. So that could be a valid reason. So these are, these are your hypotheses that you write down. And you could write down all of these without um, any information from the expert system. Okay, so in the troubleshooting exercise, you could, you could get through most of this table without any input from the actual client. These are just ideas that have come to your mind. Now we're going to show how you can start to eliminate something. The first step is to write down all the evidence that you have in sequence. We have a lot of evidence that's been given to us in the, in the case study write-up. The first one is the feed rate is being increased. That sounds obvious. We know that that's what, that's what we were intentionally doing. We were bumping up from low feed to high feed. So that's a piece of evidence that we have. And now we can go and, well, let's write down, let's, I, what I prefer to do is to write down all the initial evidence that I have that was given to me in the, in the case that the temperature is decreasing, so TC1 is decreasing. And the third piece of evidence I have is that my fuel flow rate is increasing. So those are three things that I, I read off those plots that were given. The fourth one here is that there was a smell around the fuel pump, and I can write there that that's actually an opinion. They're bearing that in mind. Then these next few points were the ones that we uncovered 
when we just ask for some preliminary information. We check preliminarily that TC1 and T4 are consistent with each other. So that we did earlier on. And that the flow rate 1 coming into the fire heater and the flow rate 7 leaving at the end there, they're consistent as well with each other. And then G and H are the last two levels <coughs> before we go into this table. And that is that the level in the tank feeding the, the feeding the flow sheet is decreasing and L200 is increasing the tank at the end. So we can document in small letters A, B, C, B what our evidence is. So there's on this sheet of paper, you add that below over here. Okay, so in the sheet that you will have on Monday, uh, there will be space down here for you to write those A, B, C numbers down. You would, you would document that. Now you come up in your table with the columns that says initial evidence, support, disprove, and neutral. And there's a small space below that where you can write down these letters corresponding. So A, B, C, D, and so on. So I'll, I'll make sure that the form you have on Monday has more than five columns. Right now your form only has space for A, B, C, D, and E. But you would have space for a few more columns in your form. Now we cross-check our evidence and see how it matches our hypothesis. So let's start with one that's, that's, a, that's a little bit more straightforward. So the temperature TC1 is decreasing. That temperature that, that's actually the problem that, that's dropping off is decreasing. Does that support any of our hypotheses or does it disprove it or does it have need, no effect on that? So, well, the, well, the fact that nothing is wrong <laughs> is that, the, it, that really, we're saying that essentially nothing is wrong, it's, the system is going to come right eventually. Well, it, it doesn't support it or, or disprove it. Let's take a look then at, I'll look at the third one first, one that does support the fuel gas heating value has decreased. So if the fuel value has decreased, the energy content has decreased, the fact that TC1 is dropping off, <coughs> That supports that assumption, right? The fact that the temperature that I'm recording is getting lower and lower supports the hypothesis that I've got less energy than I'm burning in the fuel. The stack damper being open can be supported by that as well, because if the, if the stack damper is open, the temperature one there should be decreasing. The two little area in the heat exchanger, if, if somehow the area in the heat exchanger has dropped off, that's going to be show up as the temperature TC1 decreasing. So I can write an S there in that column. Let's take a look then at, at number nine. The fuel valve is faulty and opened more than indicated. Well, if the fuel valve was faulty, that was the initial hypothesis there, I would expect, and if it was open more than indicated, it's essentially feeding more fuel. Uh, if, if everything else is okay, I should be burning that fuel and temperature one should be going up. So TC1 decreasing monotonically does not support that hypothesis at all. So I, I, I can rule, rule that out. So that, that eliminates now hypothesis number nine from consideration. I've, I've got a piece of evidence down here that disproves that that could be the cause. It's also disproved this one by number E that says that the, the temperatures are consistent. So E really is saying that TC1 and T4 are consistent. Well, that would also match that, that temperature that is, is dropping off. So that can be ruled out over there. This, is this clear, this, this approach? Now, it seems like a lot of paperwork, and, and, and it's, it does take time. I just set up this table. It takes, it takes up probably more time than we have available in the tutorial on Monday to solve the case study, to sit and think about every row and every column. Okay, so in many cases, especially when you've got a row that's disproved, you, you don't, once you've disproved it, you, just, you don't have to keep writing and think about it again. Okay? So those, the rest of the entries in that row, you don't need to, to figure out whether it supports it or disproves it. Many cases, you'll, you'll quickly come, you'll write down a hypothesis, and you can quickly eliminate it from, from a piece of information. Just scratch out that entire row then on your sheet, and don't worry about filling in the rest of the blocks. 
what we really want to get to is a point where we've cut out many of these roads from consideration. And in this case, we've, we've actually only done four of, four of them. Then the next step of the process is to say, we're moving on to obtaining additional evidence to disprove or prove either of our hypotheses. So the, the first set of columns is using what we've got given to us or what we uncovered during that, that explore phase when we were thinking about the problem. The next step is where we start to go doing experiments and gathering additional data. So that comes down to this point over here uh, in that quote. Once you've got off your desk and you're going to go into the plant, let's carry out tests and evaluate the data. We've evaluated the data now so far. We've evaluated the evidence we've got. And the next step is to carry out some tests. One of the first tests that you must carry out is to check the safety systems. So it's not on the slide here, but the very first thing that you must always do is to check your safety interlock systems. Have they been initiated? If your safety and interlock systems have been initiated, uh, then there's a, there's a good chance that a lot of those, those further steps are just not going to require the process is about to be shut down. Or alarms. So it's not just SIS, but also the alarms. If alarms are, are, are going, then it can quickly eliminate some of those hypotheses. For example, if the safety and interlock system was initiated, you can be sure that the air compressor motor fail is not a valid hypothesis. So the SIS system will go off if the air compressor has failed. So then you can eliminate that from consideration. So let's take a look then. What we're going to do is come up with some diagnostic actions that will try to eliminate the rest of our hypotheses for us. And as I said, the first one is to check the safety and interlock systems and plant alarms. These will affect some of the hypotheses and, and start to delete them for us. So the first one, the fact that the safety interlock system has not gone off means we can rule out hypothesis 11. So hypothesis 11 was that the air compressor failed. So that's, that's another one that we can remove <coughs> out there. We can sometimes do this, especially if this is a non-critical situation, just wait to see if temperature returns to the same point. Okay, so obviously when we look at the tutorial on Monday, it's a little bit artificial. We can't just say, well, I'm going to wait and hope, hope that it comes back. Um, but in, in non-time critical issues, just be aware of that. that is, one potential way of solving the problem is to real, recognize that it actually isn't a problem. It's just natural variation as we see. The key thing to recognize about this table here of additional tests that we go and do is that we try to do tests that will eliminate as many of our hypotheses or prove them or disprove them as quickly as, as possible. So here the next test that was decided to be done was to observe the air flow rate measurements. If we can watch that air flow rate measurement, we can make sure that the, the, the air being fed to the fire heater is of sufficient level to, to, man, to for the combustion. So we can, if we see the air flow rate is actually working, we can rule out air compressor motor failure, which we've already done. And based on the value of that air flow rate, we can check whether the air compressor is partially blocked or not. Or we can calculate if that air flow is enough to sustain the, the amount of fuel that we're feeding. So that, that diagnostic action down here is, is useful for proving or disproving three of, three of the other hypotheses. One thing. Uh, just sorry, just on your table, just to see where this goes, to put it in perspective. Um, unfortunately, your table that you have here in front of you is not the one that you're going to see on Monday. The one you're going to see on Monday is if you look at you've got your column there that says initial evidence, and you've got five columns for, for A, B, C, D. Let me actually just draw it up. <coughs> Then 
the table you will have is will offset will be diagnostic actions. And then you'll have columns there and we'll tend to use capital letters A, B, C, D, E. Okay, so you'll have additional columns on your table. And then down here at the bottom you've written you've written what A is and B, C and so on. And then you'll also write for my diagnostic action capital A, capital B, C, how to do those and those and those things. So your table then <coughs> <coughs> At the end, we'll look like this. So you'll have your support sort of, uh, uh, for an ends, SDs and ends in here, and then you'll have your diagnostic actions, whether those diagnostic actions support the hypothesis or not well going on in the columns next to it. So here I'm, I've, I've got it actually a little bit the other way around just for space. I've got my diagnostic action A, B, C, D, e, and so on. And I've only written these commas which ones they which ones they support. But I haven't um, got the got it in tab tabular format we would have. So at the end what we want to do is we get to a state where we can simply eliminate complete rows. Either we're eliminating it based on initial evidence, or we go and do some sort of diagnostic test on the process, and that test will either disprove or, or prove our, our hypothesis. Okay. So let's, here's, a, here's an interesting test then that was proposed. Remember in here, the issue is that we've got the temperature dropping and the fuel rate rising. And we, we discussed in last in yesterday's class that that's counter to our expectation. Right? Our expectation is that if the temperature is dropping, that the, the fuel needs to be going up with automatic control. But when that fuel goes up, we expect to see the temperature also start to go up eventually. So from a feedback control perspective, that initial part of the of the graph makes sense, but not the second part. Let me uh, Put that up here just so it's clear. This is the important to understand what's what's going on here from a feedback control because many of the case studies we'll be looking at it's an interaction between the feedback control and our regular expectation of the system that's critical to understanding the system. The time going out here on my x-axis, on the initial one is fuel, it's going up, and then it's going up without bounds. So the initial part is that temperature, flat line, and then it started to drop off. So the fact that temperature is dropping off, and fuel is going up, that's our normal expectation based on feedback control. But what we expect to see and what hasn't happened is that we expect this to go back up again. So that this, this increased amount of fuel will heat up that, that temperature. Okay? So So I initially bumped up my feed, and the moment I bumped up my feed, I needed more fuel to keep that feed. But then on the second bump up, when I, when I increased my feed, my fuel, instead of stabilizing, just kept on rising. And my temperature kept on dropping, so I was unable to control my temperature. So the fact that I'm seeing this inconsistency here makes me makes me realize my feedback control loop might be an issue here. That's why this diagnostic action is, let's put that control loop in manual and, and investigate what happens. So TC1 would normally open the flow to the fuel if the temperature is low. If we place that loop in manual, 
what we mean by that is in, in process control, the moment you place something in manual, you, you disconnect the control system from, from manipulating the valve. But what happens is that the valve position doesn't change. It stays at the position it was, and now the operator is free to manipulate that valve independently. So the operator can now go vary the fuel flow rate and observe what happens to temperature. So what, 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 what should be done over here at, at step F is, to, is the following. I'll just, just start a new, a new section over here. So this is the moment the operator places the loop in manual. And if, I, if my temperature, remember our temperature is dropping, so let's consider what's happening. The moment the operator places the loop in manual, Let's consider this the point where we go to manual. And now we're going to do a diagnostic test on the process. The diagnostic test is to see what happens if I increase or decrease this fuel flow rate. So what the operator does is, is to decrease the fuel flow. Sorry, let's say let's, let's make the operator um, be a good way to explain this. Let the operator increase the fuel flow rate. What should we see over there in the in the temperature? We expect to see an increase, but what will happen here is this. Mm -hmm. And then if the operator goes and decreases the fuel flow rate, then we see this. Okay, so expect to see greater temperature but we've actually decreased. Here we, we decrease the fuel flow rate and we see an increase back in our temperature. Does that help us? This diagnostic action? It does show us and verifies that that control loop um, might have been unstable but also here it indicates to us that my, there's something with my airflow. Okay, if I'm changing my fuel and I'm increasing my fuel, but my temperature drops off, one thing to recognize is that my airflow to that furnace is not at the right level. Okay, what we can what we can get from this experiment is to re realize that my airflow to support that increased fuel, if I don't have the necessary airflow and I'm increasing the fuel, I'm essentially putting cold fuel into that flame and I'm going to get less heat being developed by the flame. With insufficient oxygen over there, I'm not going to be able to get the temperature that I want. Essentially, I'm burning, uh, I, I don't have sufficient oxygen to support the burning. If I had the ability to measure carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide at the top, I would see my carbon monoxide increase because I've got incomplete combustion. So, and then when I come back down again, the fact that when I, this, this further emphasizes it to me, when I decrease my temperature and I see an increase in my, in my sorry, I decrease my fuel flow and then I see an increase in my temperature, it's, that's a perfect indication of that situation to me. Because now I'm putting less fuel in, cold fuel, then means that I'm putting less of that flow of that fuel in, I'm able then to get to the higher temperature that I needed to be at. Okay, so this is a little bit of a tough one to work through, um, especially if you're not familiar with furnaces and and, and delicates. But from our from our, our knowledge of combustion, we, we should have a, a it should make sense to us eventually if we think about it. Okay, this small test will help diagnose what the what the problem is a lot more for us. Okay?
So at the end of this, the fact that we can place the control loop in manual and we're able to do this test helps us solve that issue. It's a, it is a diagnostic test that may take, it may not be obvious to us to, to consider, but it is, it is something that, that helps solve this particular case study. So you have to, when it, that, when it comes to troubleshooting, it's not always clear what should be done. But I think what will help you a lot is if you look at this table, I didn't, I didn't show, but by the time we got to this diagnostic test number eight over here, sorry, uh, diagnostic test number F, we had eliminated several of the possibilities already in the table, more than, more than I'm currently eliminated. And the ones that were remaining were most of these related to airflow and fuel flow. So it would be become more apparent that making a test to check that fuel flow and that airflow ratio would be a suitable way to diagnose this case study. Okay, so the key, the key thing I want to get at here with this example is that follow a systematic approach with this table and eliminate these rows either based on the initial evidence that you have or by proposing some changes to, to make in the process. The main point is, by eliminating many of those rows, you haven't proven what the final hypothesis is. All that you've done is you just eliminate and you've got one or two possibilities remaining. So it's not necessarily the true cause, but it is a potential for the true cause. Then the, five, uh, the step five, just to talk about briefly here, is to, is to move to safe operation. That's the first, the first part of it. Move to safe operation where you can get to reasonable product production. And then from a longer term perspective, you need to solve this issue to prevent it from happening again. But um, just on that, in this particular case study, what is it that you do? What is it that you implement to get to safe operation? Which flow rate? Feed flow. Okay, bring the feed flow rate down. And what do you do regarding that fuel that's being pumped into the furnace? That you, for the past few minutes, you've been pumping fuel into the furnace. Do you shut down the air? Do you shut down the fuel? Do you increase the air, increase the fuel? Open the damper. Open the damper. One thing to bear in mind is if you've been putting fuel into a, into a furnace, the last thing you do is open the air to try and say, well, I want to increase the burning and get, get my oxygen level back up. What you first do is you cut your fuel, wait till you get to stoichiometric balance with air that is coming in, and then gradually bring the air and fuel back up. So never, never open the air up to try and burn off the fuel that you have pumped in. Rather close the fuel, you just put less in, and let the existing fuel burn off first. So that's, that's a key safety issue on this uh, case of it. Um, so, what I'll do is I'll post the notes up here. There's just a little bit more on the implementation step regarding longer term implementation. And then the final thing is we always must look back and evaluate our program. So we'll, we'll do that in the tutorial. We'll have five minutes after we solve the problem. Then we'll be able to discuss the issue and 